you live in the northern part of Egan, you will have a new state representative come 2019. Democrat Ruth Richardson defeated Republican Regina Barr by about 1,500 votes, and Ruth joins us now to talk about that and what's coming up and what's next here at the legislature for you. Welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. Let, let's talk about the election here before we get into the issues. Um, you know, you were in a, uh, a district that was held by a Republican, had been a longtime Democratic district. Uh, why do you think the reason is that you got elected? You know, I think the fact that our campaign put in the work of knocking on 40,000 doors uh, this uh, election cycle had a lot to do with our, our victory. We were able to get out and talk with neighbors, hear about the issues that they were most impacted by, and able to find common ground with them. When you were doing the door knocking, what did you hear at the door knocking that's going to inform what you're doing in the legislature? The number one issue that we were hearing about at the doors was health care. People have concerns about the affordability of health care and ensuring that they have access to health care as well. And so that is definitely something that not only I am interested in this uh, legislative session, but it's going to be a top priority, I think, for all of us uh, newly elected representatives. It certainly is going to be a, a topic that uh, people are going to be wanting to talk about. Now, you bring some background to this job that is going to inform what you're going to be doing in terms of committee work and in terms of what bills you're interested in. Tell us about that. You know, I have experience working in the nonprofit sector, the private sector, and also governmental as well. Um, when I was in the private sector, I worked as general counsel for a mortgage finance firm, so I'm very interested in consumer-related topics and also regulatory issues as well, things like securities regulation. So the Commerce Committee is something that I'm very interested in potentially uh, being a part of. I currently work with the uh, Proof Alliance, which was formerly known as the Minnesota Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, uh, an organization founded by former First Lady of Minnesota, Susan Carlson. And so with the work that I'm currently doing now, there are a lot of uh, issues that are health related. And so the Health and Human Services Committee is another one that I feel like I could bring some really important perspective to as well. Now, uh, the Democrats here are going to be in the majority, which is much more fun than being in the minority. Mm -hmm. What do you think the Democrats are going to be able to do this time around that they couldn't in the previous session? I mean, you weren't there for that, but you yes. were watching, obviously. Yes. You know, I think the number one thing that we want to avoid doing this session is having uh, bills that are over 900 pages because it's not actually efficient or effective uh, in terms of being able to pass legislation when it's over 900 pages. People don't have the ability to read through that in less than an hour and actually know uh, with transparency what they're supporting or what they're not supporting. So yeah, it's, it's a combination of them being so many subjects and then being dumped on uh, the uh, the, the representatives at the last minute, I remember seeing that time and time again, people saying we haven't had time to read this bill and then they were getting asking to vote on that stuff. So that, that does seem to be kind of crazy. Well, it's something that I'm hoping that we'll be able to avoid this session for sure. But uh, that's okay. So that's what the Democrats are going to avoid doing. What do you think they're going to be able to make happen in terms of legislation that maybe that they weren't in previous years? You know, I think one of the things that people are really expecting us to make some movement on are issues related to health care. Um, so that I know is definitely a, uh, a big goal of the caucus going in. And also uh, revisiting some issues that didn't really make any movement last legislative session. Looking at school safety issues, thinking about uh, common sense gun safety legislation as well. Um, you know, thinking about things like universal background checks, which is something that 90, over 90% 90 of folks within the U.S. support. Uh, those, those Gun violence bills that you talk about often were sat on by uh, uh, the chairman of the committees, and I think we only had like two hearings on them last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously having more hearings on that's going to be helpful. How about in the caucus itself? I mean, it isn't a Democrat-Republican issue on gun safety. It, there's, yeah. there's a lot of other things going on there. Do you think that there's enough you know, support within the caucus itself to do something? You know, I mean, when you're thinking about uh, gun safety legislation and, and many of the issues that we're thinking about this session, things like health care, um, infrastructure, our roads and bridges, they aren't really partisan issues. Um, you know, people want to ensure that they have safe communities. We want to ensure that our roads are safe. Uh, we want to ensure that we have clean water. And so I think that we are, um, at least from my perspective, really focused on ensuring that we're finding common ground to think about ways that we can move these things forward 
to ensure that we are building the best district possible. You mentioned infrastructure, roads. Mm -hmm. That usually means money's got to come from someplace. Yes. Uh, uh, Governor-elect Tim Walls has been mm -hmm. talking about that we need to raise the gas tax. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? Well, I think when you're thinking about our roads specifically, we all remember the 35W bridge collapse, and no one wants a repeat of that. And when you're thinking about uh, ensuring our roads are maintained and safe, that's something that everyone can get behind. And so um, I'm supporting what the majority of Minnesotans support as well, ensuring that our roads are safe. Speaking about the governor or the governor-elect, uh, he was recently meeting with a former governor, mm -hmm. Jesse Ventura, and the topic was legalizing recreational marijuana. Yes. What are your thoughts on that? Well, with the work that I do at the Minnesota Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome, we've been watching that uh, very closely um, because we're also thinking about the public health uh, consequences of that as well, thinking about things like prenatal exposure. And um, I think where we're going, we're moving towards legalization. And the questions that I have is how do we create a, a system that it's well regulated so we're keeping it out of the hands of youth um, and ensuring that we are maintaining um, you know, a quality public health approach to it as well. Uh, so uh, let, let's roll it back to just to healthcare here for a moment because sure. that seems to be the issue nationally that got as much attention uh, as, as locally here in the state. What can the state of Minnesota do to help those folks who are saying, my health care bills just keep going up and up and up, and there's nothing I can seem to do about that? Where, where is the problem regulation? Is the problem the pricing? Where, where in the, I mean, this is a very complicated issue, so yes. I, I, I don't think you, you know, I don't expect a simple answer, but yeah. what's your thoughts here? All of the above are really part of the part of the problem. Um, and the work that I do every day, I oversee a clinic, and so I know from a provider perspective that oftentimes there can be challenges in providing care when reimbursement rates are low. Um, and so when we have very low reimbursement rates, it can be very difficult for people to get access to services because providers will be um, uh, much more apprehensive about um, accepting different types of insurance based upon reimbursement rates. So reimbursement rates are something that are definitely an issue, especially for community-based clinics that are serving um, high-risk populations as well. Oftentimes, the cost of providing that care, uh, they're not able to recoup through that reimbursement process, so they have to find ways to leverage that in order to provide charitable care, so that definitely is an issue. Uh, the rising cost is a huge issue. We need to figure out a way to control costs, and I think in terms of the complexity of the situation, the very first thing that we have the ability to do is to take the advice of Governor Dayton and expand the buy-in option for Minnesota Care to give more opportunities for people who are facing barriers accessing insurance. Next topic I have you sounds like a little bit technical, but actually it's pretty simple. It's called yeah. preemption. Yes. And this is where the state says, sorry, local government, we're going to make the laws you can't. Yes. Uh, the last time around here, we saw that as a way to try to stop uh, minimum wage mm -hmm. laws from going into effect. Uh, I, we have a different mix in the legislature. I don't think that's going to be what's happening, but tell me what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think when you're thinking about cities specifically um, and the issue of preemption, oftentimes people who are closest to the issues are those that are on the ground working with them. And so cities bring a perspective to lawmaking that is much more difficult to have when you're thinking from the state level or even from the federal level as well. And so ensuring that people who are closest to the issues have a voice in deciding how those cities are run, I think is, is, is important. Um, I know that it's come up with a minimum wage. It's also come up with smoking as well. I think Adina just recently passed an ordinance um, that raised the age for buying nicotine. Um, and again, that's something that they really saw as being the a, a really uh, strong way to support their community, and I think we need to leave those doors open. The flip side of that is you have a patchwork of laws, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, with minimum wage, there's always the argument, well, our economy is just a little bit different here than, the, than maybe some other places, but when you start talking about smoking, kids mm -hmm. are kids no matter where you are, and yeah. the argument is, well, they'll just go into the next city to go buy those mm -hmm. cigarettes. Is that something that should be addressed at the state level? You know, thinking uh, about that with cigarettes, 
alcohol as well. Um, there were times when people could cross state lines to get alcohol when they were um, maybe younger than the age of the, the state that they, that they were living in. Um, what it really comes down to is that these local cities have a better uh, sort of thumb on the pulse to know what's going on locally uh, to be able to have the voters decide who they want to support and who uh, and what they want to bring forward in terms of legislation. I think it's important that cities uh, continue to have that ability to do that. All right. We've been speaking with Ruth Richardson. She is the new representative for the northern part of Egan and several other cities around here as well. We don't want to leave them out. But uh, Ruth, thank you for coming in today. And again, congratulations on your victory. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time.